pleasure to be with you virtually for today's Bible study. Uh, I greet you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm excited to get uh, into part three uh, of our Bible study on Christian character out of the book of Daniel. Uh, before we uh, dive into the text and, and go into the lesson, um, we do want to take uh, the awesome opportunity to be able to go before the throne of grace and submit our petitions to the Lord in prayer. Surely, surely we have uh, much to pray about and many that stand in the need of prayer. So if you would uh, join with me in prayer, I'm going to call out uh, some, some names and needs and then uh, we will go before the Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, first, we want to lift up in prayer, Brother Clyde Berry Sr. Um, he is set to undergo his first cancer treatment today. Um, we also have Sister Bertha Doucette that has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Um, the doctors are working with and for her. Uh, she has a surgery that is pending for Tuesday of next week. Sister Wanda Williams uh, is having some heart issues. We want to keep her lifted up in prayer, along with uh, Brother Milton Arby, uh, Edward Wheaton, Larry Henry, uh, Brother James Leonard. He is in the VA hospital. We want to keep him lifted up in prayer. And then, of course, just the things that are going on naturally in this world. Um, there are hurricanes. Uh, on one coast and wildfires on another coast. So we want to keep in mind and keep lifted up in prayer all those who are affected uh, by these natural disasters uh, and also the first responders that are uh, attending to their needs. Furthermore, we have, um, you know, our, our youth, our children that are being educated uh, in the school system. We want to always keep them lifted up in prayer um, as they go forth in the school year. Amen. So if you would, um, have your eyes closed and bow your head in reverence to God and let's go to the Lord in prayer and seek his mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you on today, Father God, for just giving us another opportunity, giving us another day uh, that we can uh, experience your grace, Father God, and, and that we would be an instrument of your will. We ask, Father God, that you would um, touch the situations that we've described, Father God, that, that the names that we have called out and the situations that we've stated, Father God, that you would just be in the midst and, and comfort them. Uh, where they may be broken down, and that you would heal them, Father God, where they may be afflicted, and that in, in some of the cases, Father God, if not all of the cases, that however it may turn out um, uh, medically, Father God, that, that spiritually you would, you would bring growth, Father God, that you would bring uh, people closer together in a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ, Father God. We know that you're a healer, Father God, so we know that whether it's through, uh, uh, through medicine, Father God, through doctors and nurses, Father God, or whether it's just through a miraculous healing, Father God, we know that you are able to heal the body from head to toe, Father God. So we ask that you would bless uh, all these that we've called out from the, from the crown of their head down to the sole of their feet. Father God, even if you choose to go another way, Father God, we know that you are able. We ask also, God, that you would um, that you would be with those that are afflicted by the natural disasters. We know that this earth, Father God, has been uh, has been affected by sin and it's groaning, Father God. It's waiting for the day, Father God. It's waiting uh, for you to return and make all things new, Father God. But in the meantime, uh, while we're dealing with these uh, issues of life, Father God, we ask that you would just have mercy on us and that you would uh, be able to give those people comfort 
in their time of affliction, Father God, that you would give guidance, that it would be the best help uh, to those that are in need, Father God. And please, Father God, we ask that you would continue to place a hedge of protection around our, our youth, uh, around our young adults as they uh, seek to get their education, Father God. We know that some are on campus. We know that some are virtual, Father God. But either way, we ask that you would please bless their going out and bless their coming in, Father God. Keep them safe from any hurt, harm, or danger. We'll be ever so careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. We ask these and other blessings in the precious and powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church said, amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen. Well, welcome back to our um, study that we're going through in the, in the book of Daniel. We're concentrating specifically on how uh, Christian character is... Uh, defined and developed and displayed throughout the book of Daniel. We've been looking at chapter 1, and we started on chapter 2 uh, on Sunday, and so now we are uh, in the middle. You can turn to Daniel chapter 2, verse 24. Daniel chapter 2, verse 24. And we're going to pick up where we left off on Sunday. Uh, on Sunday, we... We talked about in our men's uh, Sunday school, we talked about um, the dream that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, and he was looking for the dream, and he was also looking for the interpretation, something that wasn't able to be provided by his spiritual advisory committee of um, magicians and sorcerers, astrologers, and Chaldeans. Um, but we come to learn as we continue to read through Daniel chapter 2 that uh, God would reveal the dream and its interpretation to Daniel, uh, the author of this book, uh, who was a um, who was a uh, he would be given by God the interpretation and the dream itself and so that's where we left off where Daniel would give thanks and praise to God for giving uh, this dream and interpretation and so now we're going into verse 24 through the end of the chapter and Daniel is now going to reveal in public to the king what God has revealed to him in private. Amen. So just for setting the stage in a little context, I want to go ahead and read uh, starting in verse 24 to give us a little bearing on, on where we are. Okay. So Daniel chapter 2 verse 24 reads on this fashion. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, Therefore Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and thus said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said, Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. So now we see that after Daniel has had the prayer meeting with his friends, he's had a prayer meeting 
with his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who were also youths that were taken captive from Judah. He now goes to Arioch, who he had stopped before to ask for more time to say that, hey, we're going to go to the king and ask for more time. And so this same person, now he goes uh, to him and says, look, now stop killing all these wise men because Nebuchadnezzar had given a decree that since the wise men, so-called wise men of Babylon, which were the astrologers and the magicians and the Chaldeans, since they could not give the interpretation of the dream and the dream itself, Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, go ahead and just start killing them all because they can't do for me what I need them to do. So Daniel now begins to plead on the behalf of the wise men of Babylon because he was being trained to be a part of that very same group. And so he was included in that number. So that meant that if something didn't happen, if there wasn't a miracle, he was going to get caught up and, and face the same fate. So he tells Arioch, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. So then um, watch, watch, watch what Arioch does. Watch what Arioch does. In verse 25, then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and thus said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. I just want to pause here parenthetically just for a moment. And if you, if you have your hand out in front of you, this is your first blank. Daniel went to Arioch, but Arioch says he found Daniel. Daniel went to Arioch, but he says he found Daniel. Sometimes when you're dealing with people in the world, they're going to try to take credit for the things that you have done as something that they have done. Now, Arioch was not looking for anyone except for to kill them in terms of the wise men. But yet he would tell the king, hey, I found this guy that's a captive of Judah. And guess what? He, king, he's going to tell you exactly what you want to know. Just a little side note. Just so if you think that 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 maybe on your job or maybe you know uh, amongst some other situation that there's someone else that tries to take credit for what you what you have done or or, or try to take advantage of the gift that you've been, been given in order to aggrandize himself. Well, it's been going on like that for a long time. But Daniel doesn't really worry about that. He keeps moving on because now he has an audience with the king. Arioch's out of the picture. And the king is now addressing Daniel and says, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Because remember, the magicians and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans, all the, the spiritual advisory committee of Nebuchadnezzar, they were trying to get Nebuchadnezzar to tell them the dream and then we'll give you the interpretation king so you got to give us something to work with here because we can't give you the dream and give you the interpretation and so they go back and forth with the king and the king decides hey look it's all or nothing and if it's nothing then he'll make sure that you no longer exist so that's the situation. So Nebuchadnezzar is, is, is trying to get straight to the point. Can you tell me the dream and its interpretation? Because I'm not interested in hearing anything else but what I'm looking for. So your second blank, Daniel declares that the secret is his profession, but it's God's provision. The secret is his profession. But God's provision, what do I mean? Let's take a look. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answers and says, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But 
There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, the thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this, and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. What will be. So Daniel wants to let him know, look, king, I'm going to tell you the dream, and I'm going to tell you the vision. I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for, but I need you to understand something about how it came. So I'm going to give you a profession. I'm going to tell you the dream and its interpretation, but I need you to understand that it's not coming from me. It's not coming from me as a human being. It's not me being any smarter. It's not me being better studied. It's not anything about me as an individual person. I need you to know that this has been provided by God. So as Arioch tries to take credit for bringing Daniel to the king, he's trying to take credit for something that he didn't do. Daniel is about to give the profession. So when he gives the king the answer, then obviously he's going to be credited by the king that, hey, you accomplished this task. But instead of trying to take credit that doesn't belong to him, he deflects the credit and says, no, let me put the credit where the credit is due. Let me make sure that God gets the credit for whatever is about to go on here. So Daniel declares that the secret is his profession. He's going to say the words, but it is God's provision. It is God's provision. Picking up at verse 30, but as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. That you may know the thoughts of your heart. So, Daniel's about to go into the dream that that's been given but again he's continuing and he's going to give the king the reason why this dream and interpretation this explanation and interpretation are going to be provided so on on the third line of your handout the interpretation is made known for the sake of Daniel and his friends the interpretation is made known for the sake of Daniel and his friends. Where am I getting that? So again in verse 30. It says. But as for me this secret has not been revealed to me. Because I have more wisdom than anyone living. So again he's calling back. to, Hey this is not coming from me. This is not something that I have personally produced. It's just being transmitted through me. Okay. And he continues on again in verse 30. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king. Now, Daniel is the only one that we're hearing about that gets brought to the king. Because Arioch says that he brought Daniel before the king. So that's one individual person. So why wouldn't it say, but for my sake? Well, again, if we look back at what we already studied, the the. Secret was revealed to Daniel in verse 19. The secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. And that night vision came during this prayer meeting that was uh, being conducted by Daniel and his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And not only with Daniel and his friends, but then all the rest of the wise men that were still living as well, it's for their sakes because if the, if the king gets the dream explained and the interpretation, then he's not going to kill people anymore because now he has what he wants. Does that make sense? So Daniel is, is, is trying to <laughs> let him know that for, the, for our sakes, <laughs> uh, who make known the interpretation to the king, that's why this has been provided. 
So there is a, there is a care for, um, for the sanctity of life. In order, in order to save life, that is why uh, this dream is being revealed and explained, and then it's going to be interpreted as well. And also, um, for Nebuchadnezzar's sake, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So there was an immaterial part of Nebuchadnezzar, his innermost being. And in his heart, he's wrestling, he's trying to understand as best he can what this dream is. What this dream is. So now we're going to have the actual, now, now that the stage has been set, now Daniel can go ahead and tell the story of what the dream actually is. So the stage has been set. Now there is the story uh, to be told. Take a look at verse 31, picking up there. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So we see a statue that's been described with a head of gold, a chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs iron, and feet iron and mixed with clay. But there's another part of the, of the dream. Verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, so now we're going back up in reverse order. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. So let's pause right there for a moment. Wow. So Daniel goes ahead and, and tells the king his dream. And there is a dream of a multi-metallic mega man. And this multi-metallic Mega Man is described in terms of different types of metals that constitute its body, which is, as the text says, one image. It was all one image, but it had these different separate parts and different materials. And then from there, we see a stone that was cut out without hands, which then strikes this same multi-metallic mega man on its feet. So it, it strikes it at the base. And when the stone strikes the statue at the base, it is crushed and turns to dust. But then as that image is now destroyed and the stone has already struck, then that stone now grows to fill the entire earth. So we see some fantastic, fantastic imagery, and this is given uh, as a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, and then, but it's concealed. So he, he knows what he saw, Nebuchadnezzar knows what he saw. He recognizes what he saw. But what he's struggling with is that he does not know what this means. What does it mean 
to see this, this great image of this multi-metallic mega man, and then a stone comes and destroys it, and then the stone grows up and fills the whole earth. To give you the Cliff Notes version, what, what does this mean? Well, chapter 2 in Daniel parallels chapter 7, and we'll see a very similar um, type of, of dream, type of vision. And so for the purposes of this uh, Bible study, because we're not getting so much into prophecy, we're focusing more on Christian character. So I want to briefly treat um, the meaning and, and interpretation of the statue, but I want to continue on and really look at the dynamics of what this meant in terms of Daniel and the king then, um, and then also uh, in terms of Daniel's character, and then also what it means for us now in terms of Christian character. Amen? But let's take a look and, and make sure that we have a proper grasp of this uh, statue and the stone, the strike and the structure, okay? So picking up in verse 37, we see the interpretation that Daniel is about to give. So now we're going to take a look at verse 37 through verse 43. So we're halfway there. Nebuchadnezzar has the dream portion. Now we want to get the interpretation. And here's what Daniel says. In verse 37, you, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. You are this head of gold. So in the um, chart that you have in the middle of your handout where it says statue, so uh, we have the different body parts listed, and then the type of material, and then you have a blank for the corresponding meaning. So we're given the meaning right here that the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and overall the Babylonian empire. It, it represents the empire that Nebuchadnezzar uh, inherited and uh, built into a world power, okay, into a world power. So, so obviously Nebuchadnezzar probably at this time is very flattered because everybody wants to hear that they're the head of gold. <laughs> um, but it's after this that things get... Uh, uh, probably a little more interesting for Daniel uh, telling the current ruler uh, about what is next, what is to come. So we've learned, okay, that the head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. And we're going to continue on in verse 39. Daniel says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. And that would represent the silver. So the silver chest and arms. And then Daniel goes on to say, then another, which is the kingdom, the third kingdom of bronze, which would be inferior to the second kingdom of silver, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. So now we see the legs and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron in as much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. So we've gone from the head down 
to the chest and arms, down to the belly and the thighs, down to the legs, and then all the way down to the feet. And we see that each one of these is describing a uh, kingdom in terms of a world empire. And so he says uh, in verse uh, 42, And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So we see this multi-metallic mega man, different descending um, parts of the body, different descending materials, and as we look back in history, we can see what these world empires are. We'll study this more in Daniel 7, but just to give you an idea, when we look at the Bible and we look at history, we see that the head of gold we've already been given uh, is the Babylonian Empire. The chest and arms of silver, this would be the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, that's your blank. The belly and thighs of bronze, that would refer to the Greek Empire, assembled by Alexander the Great. And then the legs uh, of iron, this would refer to the Roman Empire, the old Roman Empire. And then the feet, and uh, which are made up of the iron and clay, this is uh, something that is yet future that would be seen in Revelation as a uh, ten king confederacy, a revived or reconstituted Roman Empire. But this vision is given in terms of a panorama of history, okay? So we can look back and see most of this is still in the past, but some of it is still yet future, okay? But that gives us the multi-metallic mega man in terms of how it's presented to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar would not know about who was next, but he knows that there is something next. He knows that there's going to be another world empire, then another, then another, so on and so forth. So he understands his place in the world. Daniel's trying to explain to him um, what God has revealed prophetically about uh, how history will unfold, how history will unfold. So now in verse 44 and 45, we see the stone, the strike, and the structure. The stone, the strike, and the structure. Look at verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Verse 45, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. So let's take a closer look at the stone, the strike, and the structure. Okay, The stone... As, as you've probably already come to the conclusion, the stone is Jesus Christ. The stone is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And, and how do we know that the stone is Jesus Christ? Well, there's a few scriptures that we can go to um, to get you know, an idea. Uh, first, we can go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at verses... Uh, 4 to 8. Yes, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 4 to 8. Listen as it reads. 
coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and who believes on him will by no means put to sh be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, disobedient the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Okay, We can also see uh, in the Gospels, Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20 and uh, verse 17 and verse 18. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whom, whoever it falls, it will grind him into powder. So when you're looking at this stone, you definitely uh, want to fall on the stone rather than having the stone fall on you. Take advantage of the opportunity while it's available that you can fall on the rock, that you can rest on the rock and in the rock, and you'll be broken of your, your sinful life, but you will be saved as opposed to continuing to live without being saved, without being delivered, and this multi-metallic mega man is a representation of the world system that will be destroyed. And in Daniel, it says that it's going to be turned into dust. It's all one image. So even though it strikes at the feet of iron and clay, the entire image crumbles down and is destroyed. And so we can see that that this stone is Jesus Christ. Furthermore, look at Matthew 7, uh, chapter 24, uh, of, of the rock. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew 7, we're in verse 24, 25. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall. Why? For it was founded on the rock. For it was founded on the rock. So the stone is Jesus Christ. And, and looking at your handout, the next blank, the stone is Jesus Christ. But now we have to figure out, is this regarding Jesus' first coming or second coming? Is this his first coming or second coming? Well, we have to take a look at Jesus' first coming. Uh, death, sin, and the grave were defeated. He established his church, but he didn't establish his kingdom. Daniel is talking about establishing a kingdom, so that means that this is referring to Jesus' second coming. So that's your blank. The stone is Jesus Christ at his second coming. And you can look to Revelation verse 19 to 21. Uh, uh, for a, a text of scripture on that. So now that we have the stone, then we have the strike. We have the strike. So the stone itself, and then it's going to strike the feet of clay, is going to strike the feet of clay mixed with iron. And the strike is the fall of Babylon and the battle of Armageddon. Again, in Revelation that you'll see in Revelation 18 and 21 and Revelation 17 through 14. When you have an opportunity, take a look at that and you'll see uh, how that ties in together. Okay, so we have the stones, Jesus Christ at his second coming. 
we have the strike is the fall of Babylon. And just to touch on the, uh, the fall of Babylon uh, quickly, in Revelation I just want you to see Revelation 17, looking at verse um, 14, Revelation 17 and 14. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So we have a description here in verse seven, in, in chapter 17, verse 14, about a conflict will take place, the, the ultimate battle that will be at Armageddon. And then if you move over to chapter 18 and verse 21, we see uh, the end of Babylon. Verse 21 in chapter 18 of Revelation. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Shall not be found anymore. So obviously we as uh, Christians, we as New Testament believers, we have the opportunity to look back and see uh, through the entire canon of Scripture and see what all was meant and... Um, I praise God. It's a blessing that that we, uh, through studying the Bible, can actually understand the prophecies better than the prophets that prophesied them. So uh, Daniel struggled with uh, trying to figure out what these things meant, but we have the opportunity and the ability to look back into history, look back into Scripture with more um, revelation that God has given us in the New Testament and see um, what is going on with these prophecies. So we see the stone, Jesus Christ, at his second coming. We see the strike, the fall of Babylon, and the battle of Armageddon. And then we also see the structure. The structure is now a new structure. So the old structure of the multi-metallic mega man has been destroyed, and in its place is now a new structure, uh, which is that same stone, but now that same stone is going to grow up, uh, grow up and grow out to a great mountain. Okay? It's going to grow up and grow out to a great mountain that will fill the entire earth. So this structure, the, the, the great mountain, uh, and the next blank for you is the millennial kingdom and the eternal state. The millennial kingdom and the eternal state. So we have uh, in Revelation 20, verses 4 through 5, we have a description of the thousand-year reign that Christ will have on earth that will be his administration, his kingdom, and that will continue into the eternal state um, where all things will be made new. So overall, we see the structure of human government in the multi-metallic mega man, and we see the kingdom of Christ that will come uh, at a time future and destroy all those kingdoms that man has attempted to set up. And then it will grow into a great mountain that will fill the entire earth. So the, there will be a time uh, in the millennial kingdom where the entire earth will be under the rule and reign of Christ, and we'll be able to enjoy that forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So the stone, the strike, the structure have been identified along with the statue. And so now that Daniel has said a mouthful to Nebuchadnezzar, now comes the moment of truth for Daniel because he knows what God has revealed to him in private, to him and his companions. 
and he goes to proclaim it to the king in public. But up until this point, Nebuchadnezzar has not said anything. He's just been listening, and he had to be on the edge of his seat because he's just got to be looking at Daniel like, wow, this guy is telling me everything that I dreamed, and he's telling me what it means. So, but Daniel doesn't know how Nebuchadnezzar is going to respond. So I have to commend Daniel that regardless of the results, Daniel did not know what would happen when he went into the king's court and told him the dream and its interpretation. There was no guarantee that Nebuchadnezzar would not like what he said and could have killed Daniel and his companions and all the rest of the, all the, rest of the wise men where they stood. He had no guarantee other than he was going to be faithful to God and whatever happened, he accepted. So Daniel courageously proclaims the truth to uh, the king, the one that's in the highest office of the land that has authority over him, but he speaks truth to power. Regardless of result, he speaks the truth. So I have to commend and applaud Daniel for having the courage to go and stand before the king, stand before power, stand before authority, earthly power and authority, and speak the truth that God gave him to speak. So we see in, in, in verse 46 to 49, now we see uh, the stature of Nebuchadnezzar and the stature of Daniel. We see uh, in, in verse 46, verse 46 through verse 49, let's read so we can uh, get a bearing of what Nebuchadnezzar's response is to this awesome revelation of God. Verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. Then the king answered Daniel and said, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Verse 49, also Daniel petitioned the king and, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So even though that's just a few short verses, there's a lot to unpack in verses 46 through 49. So we see the stage and the story where Daniel sets the stage, makes sure Nebuchadnezzar understands that, hey, I'm going to tell you this dream and interpretation. It's not uh, from me. It's just coming through me. It's not it's my profession, but it's God's provision. OK, we see the. Uh, the image of the multi-metallic mega man in the statue, and then the dream continues on with the stone, the strike, and the structure, and Daniel gives him the overview of what they knew at the time of what this meant in terms of uh, overarching prophecy uh, through to the end times. Through, And then we see now the stature of the king and the stature of Daniel and so we see a change in stature because when Daniel was speaking to the king, Nebuchadnezzar would have been on his throne. And usually thrones in this time, uh, there were a set of stairs or steps and the, the king would be on a raised platform and he would be seated looking down on whoever was addressing him from his court. So Nebuchadnezzar is the king, but in verse 46 Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the king, but he ends up prostrate, okay? 
That's your uh, first blank under stature. He ends up prostrate. Prostrate is where you're assuming a position of worship where not only are you on your knees, but you are flat on the ground, laying flat out on the ground. So we would see um, this position and this pose in various parts, and this was a uh, symbol of, of submission, a symbol, a symbol of, of worship and, and honor to whom it was placed in terms of the, the object or the person that there was uh, an appreciation, okay? So Nebuchadnezzar was sitting high up on the throne looking down at Daniel in the beginning before the dream and, interpret and interpretation were declared. But we see that by the end of the explanation and interpretation that Nebuchadnezzar ends up laying down on the floor prostrate before Daniel. So Nebuchadnezzar is the king, but he ends up prostrate, verse 46. Verse 47, we see the king actually uh, uttering his answer. And the king answered Daniel and said, truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. So Nebuchadnezzar, again, is a pagan king. And but he is he cannot deny the awesome power that the Lord is demonstrating through Daniel. So he has to recognize uh, the God of Daniel. He has to recognize the God of Israel. But you have to take a very close look. He's taking a step in the right direction. But he's not quite there because he says to Daniel, truly your God. Truly, your God is the God of gods. So even though Nebuchadnezzar, as the king, has come down and laid himself prostrate, he is still not submitting himself to the God of Israel because he describes the God of Israel as in terms of Daniel as your God, not his God, in terms of Nebuchadnezzar. He has not accepted and surrendered that the God of Israel is not just supremely sovereign. So he recognizes the sovereignty. He recognizes this is the best I've ever seen because the wise men and the Chaldeans and the sorcerers they would do their parlor tricks and they would credit them to certain pagan gods that at best were demons that were at work in that time. But now he sees something that no one could ever do. But he still can only say, well, your God is the best that I've seen. That's the best I've ever seen giving me the dream and giving me the interpretation. Boy, Daniel, buddy, your God, he's a one. So he recognizes that God is supremely sovereign, but he misses a critical point, and this is your second blank under stature. Nebuchadnezzar praises God as supremely sovereign, but not as solely sufficient. He praises God as supremely sovereign, but not as solely sufficient. Sufficient. There's a lot of people nowadays, even in our modern time, they still have appreciation for the God of the Bible. They still have appreciation for even Jesus Christ or even appreciation for the Holy Spirit. They have appreciation for Christianity and, and, and what is revealed in the, in the Bible, but they fall short and stop at appreciation. They never make it to adoration. God of the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the Godhead, is not going to accept anything less than 
being recognized as the sole and sufficient God. Jesus Christ is our sole and sufficient Savior, not just a first amongst equals, not just one participant in a pantheon of deities, but the one and only true and holy living God. That is what the Bible reveals, is that yes, God is supremely sovereign, but he is also solely sufficient. But don't give up on Nebuchadnezzar just yet, because we're in chapter 2. But I just want to highlight that in his paganism, he's taken an important step, but he's not quite there to the point of belief and the point of trust in, at this point, the God of Israel. Verse 48, and we're almost through. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel, remember we had Nebuchadnezzar as the king. He's on the throne looking down, and we have Daniel. He is uh, on the uh, floor speaking to the king. Nebuchadnezzar becomes prostrate before Daniel, but now Daniel is going to get elevated. Daniel is going to get promoted. Daniel is a servant, but ends up promoted. That's your second to last blank. And he's promoted um, from being over uh, the province of Babylon to now he's a chief administrator. So he is now the head of the spiritual advisory council. So he's over all the wise men of Babylon, the ones that are left that didn't get killed in the, in the first wave. Um, and he now moves on in verse 49 that after his promotion, Daniel now petitions the king. That's your last blank. Daniel petitions the king on behalf of his friends. In verse 49, also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So Daniel did not forget his friends. Daniel did not forget his friends. The same friends that were there in the emergency prayer meeting at night, that they were seeking the mercies of the Lord, and they were... Uh, trying to get uh, the vision from God so that they could give the, uh, the answer, reveal the secret to Nebuchadnezzar the king to save their lives and the lives of others. They were there. And even though Daniel is given the credit by Nebuchadnezzar, by the king, he accepts the promotion, but he remembers his friends and so his friends also get promoted to essentially to his old job. And so uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were placed over the affairs of the province of Babylon over the city. So um, they now get promoted as well. And then the very last portion of the verse, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So not only was Daniel made the head of the Babylonian Spiritual Advisory Committee, but also now he's a Supreme Court Justice. When you sat in the gate, that meant you were a judge. So now Nebuchadnezzar has promoted and placed Daniel and his friends into elevated positions in government because they had the courage and the conviction and the candor to communicate the truth that God gave them to speak. So in terms of Christian character, we see no compromise on the part of Daniel and his friends. We see tremendous courage. We see candor being able to speak truth to power. And we see uh, that as a result of all that, they are rewarded not just with spiritual things, but they're rewarded in an earthly manner. They are rewarded in an earthly manner. 
I hope that uh, this lesson has blessed you um, and I encourage you to um, read over the book of Daniel and take a look at the, the promises in the prophecies that Daniel has given, um, again, as a profession, not as his provision. It didn't come uh, through man, uh, or it didn't come from man, but it came through man. And so Daniel uh, is an encouragement because when you see uh, the prophecy that declares the end from, uh, from uh, the beginning, we already know how it's going to turn out. We know that no matter what kingdom we fall under, no matter what political ruler, no matter what political party, no matter what regime, it does not matter who is in charge or in power in an earthly sense. We know how it's going to end up. That, that after uh, the fullness of time and prophecy is fulfilled, that the true ruler in Jesus Christ will set everything right. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. Amen.